Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the eighth episode of Altitude, the place for us to discuss interesting industry topics, innovations, challenges, and have a general gossip about aviation. Today's episode is entitled Into the Danger Zone. I can only apologise that due to rights issues, we've been unable to play the Kenny Loggins Top Gun classic. <laughs> However, despite that, we have got a very special Royal Air Force episode to celebrate what is in the UK, Armed Forces Week. My name is Aidy Dolan and I am delighted to be here back in the hot seat this month for what is such an important and fascinating topic. The UK is one of the few countries around the world with a joint integrated civil and military ATC service with Nats and Ministry of Defence controllers sitting side by side in our control centre in Swanwick in Hampshire. The close relationship allows us to have greater cooperation and a flexible use of the airspace. But what's the difference between civil and military ATM and how do we work together on a day to day basis? The challenges that we both face are very similar, growing traffic levels, the integration of unmanned air systems and improving constantly the levels of safety and cost efficiency. But it's through close and effective cooperation that we can meet these challenges whenever they should appear. We've got 30 minutes to try and squeeze in everything from sonic booms and quick reaction alert to what's been happening during COVID and military training exercises. We're going to go deep into the world of 78 Squadron. That's the new squadron number for RAF Swanee. With me to explore this are two very special guests. Please welcome to Altitude Wing Commander Chrissy Miller, Officer Commanding of 78 Squadron. Good afternoon, Chrissy. Hi, AD. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. It's great to have you with us. We've also got someone who I remember as a fresh-faced trainee controller at Heathrow 17 years ago. Well, as you can see, we can't see much of his face these days, but he has gone on to great things nonetheless. It's our very own general manager of Swanwick Operations, Gary Dixon. How are you, Gary? Yeah, I'm really good, Eddie. Good to see you again. Excellent. So as ever, please put your questions to our guests uh, into the show through the message box that you should see somewhere on your screen. We'll try and rattle through as many as we can at the end. But for now, let's crack on. Chrissy, could you start by explaining to us what is the role of 78 Squadron and how does that fit into the general Swanwick operation? So, AD, um, 78 Squadron has a very specific mission in the fact that we provide uh, air traffic control services and critical supporting functions to enable the safe provision of UK air power. But what that actually means in terms of what we provide it is, is much broader. We provide area radar services, so essentially air traffic control above 10,000 feet across the UK, uh, airspace management across the entirety of the UK. We provide distress and diversion, which is essentially emergency services uh, for civil and military aircraft. Um, we have radar analysis, uh, which is tasked from cross-government departments. And we also have Northolt Radar, uh, which provide the radar terminal services within the London TMA uh, to Northolt Station. So really varied. Yeah, very much so. Can you give us an example of, of how NATS works with the military day to day? So... It, in a nutshell, every day is different. But um, to give you a, probably a, quite a good uh, example in terms of just how intertwined we are, a, a good example is Exercise Cobra Warrior, uh, a really big exercise that happened in March. Uh, and it just showed just how much we have to work together from an air, ATM and an airspace management point of view. Uh, the airspace was specifically designed by the RAF and NATS initially, and then it was tactically managed by our air traffic controllers and our airspace managers on the day. Um, in the planning phase, we were made aware that the airspace precluded civil operations in certain parts of the, the what we were blocking off in terms of airspace. And so part of the, the role we played in that was to facilitate inbounds and outbounds out of Newcastle, so providing services to civil aircraft as part of the exercise, as it were. So it, it just shows that balanced approach we have to ensuring uh, we, we're providing that support to the large force exercises, but we're also balancing it, that against the civil operation as well. And that's what probably makes our relationship quite unique. Excellent. I mean, Gary, when I've ever visited the TC Ops room, you see the the Nats and the military controllers like Heathrow and Northall sitting just a few yards apart. What's what's the benefit from your civil side of operating so closely together like that? 
so, so you're right, Adi, within both ops rooms, so on the TC side for, for North Holt and also on the area side uh, for um, for the military controllers based there, we do have them literally sat side by side. Um, it's difficult to put a value against the, the benefit of, of, of something like that, but a huge benefit is that interworking and the collaboration that they can then provide. Um, Chrissy touched on there that that ability for us to be more flexible and, and for the teams to really get a, 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 a genuine understanding of the challenges that each other face, understand some of the issues within the airspace um, and, and understand collectively how they can make each other's lives easier. Um, that the, 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 there's something about that way of working during normal operations that under understanding the, the person as well as the task mm. that means when we have to deal with non-standard events it just becomes a little bit easier there's somebody in the room that you can talk to it's it, it's not just a voice at the end of the the phone yeah. and, and there's somebody genuinely there to help you out as well which i think really does make a difference for us absolutely yeah i completely agree and, and chrissy the uk space is in no, non-covid times is, is extremely busy and challenging and complex as we know and it needs to be managed and shared appropriately so how does that actually work from your perspective so in terms of airspace management so we've got a, a flight three flight who deal with the airspace management side the uk is really quite unique in the fact that our airspace management shared equally between civil and military so two people sh share that role of airspace manager and it's a constant job that requires careful management but ultimately it means you know we have to strike the balance between what the military requires and what civil requires um and also one one side can't decide something without the other fortunately for us um the two people get on quite well so it works quite well but um certainly everything in terms of airspace policy from high level all the way down to the tactical delivery all of it's entrenched in that J J and I approach um certainly a, a good example of you know where we've seen uh, very agile airspace management between military and civil uh, was the recent formidable shield exercise it was about a month ago primarily a Navy exercise in detecting and countering ballistic missiles. And we were part, part of that planning process in terms of civil and military about two years ago as we determined how we would segregate the, the large swathes of airspace because ultimately it blocked off about 597 kilometres squared wow. um, of airspace, huge amounts across multiple flight information regions. Um, but during that exercise on the day, the civil and military airspace managers worked really closely together to activate, deactivate the airspace um, and any associated associated flight planning routes um, but clearly it had to be really agile and flexible to ensure that we gave maximum flexibility back to civil as soon as we possibly could but um, certainly the two working together so closely ultimately enabled a successful exercise. Wow I mean that's a, a great example of teamwork and that's what ATC is all about and something that, that I know that Christy you guys uh, are very much focused on is something called QRA or quick reaction alert we see episodes of that in the news and on TV um, the RF is obviously monitoring UK airspace 24 hours a day, 365 days per year. But how does the QRA process actually work? So in terms of uh, surveilling the UK airspace, our sister squadron, 19 squadron up the road at RAF Scampton, they're soon to move to RF Bulmer. Um, they look at the airspace 24-7. They've got military and civil radar feeds going in so they can see as much as possible. And they've got a, a, a big team of identification officers and weapons controllers who basically can provide a trigger to QRA at any time. Um, in terms of, if you want me to go on to examples, I can. Um, but in terms of Swanwick itself, Swanwick wouldn't necessarily scramble QRA. That would be down to the Control and Reporting Centre at Scampton to scramble, and then we would support them. Okay, and, and Gary, I mean that's a that's a big undertaking. There's a there's a military jet now going to enter this airspace, and and there's there's obviously a lot of commercial traffic using it. And how does that affect us at, at Nats and, and Nats Swanwick, and how do Nats controllers react to clear that airspace? So it's probably the best example that I can give you AD of where we see the benefit of that side by side working and um, the, the early notification the, the heads up that the military team can can give us a, a, ahead of even the QRA being scrambled. Um, uh, that additional time that we get just gives us the ability to start to clear a path, not only for the um, for the military aircraft, but also for for the the civil aircraft that that, that may be around either a, an aircraft that the military are going to intercept or, or an aircraft that they might have a concern about. Um, 
certainly during the the busier times uh, we, we operate very complex very very densely um, uh, uh, populated airspace and um, that additional time to be able to clear the route to be able to to come up with some additional options uh, and also just to make sure that all of the aircraft that, that we're trying to separate there are managed safely uh, that's that's a real benefit for us um D depending on the time of day, there might be tactical interventions that are required. Um, and I certainly know that, that you, you'll recognise the need to sometimes stop departures on the ground. And we, we also recognise the need to sometimes hold them in the air as well. Uh, and and to, to just clear enough space for everyone to be able to operate safely uh, and, and to make sure that the, um, the the military aircraft get to where they need to, to get to quickly. Well, I mean, for the sake of for our viewers kind of understanding, let's kind of look at an imagined scenario where we have uh, a commercial airliner which has entered the UK space from an adjoining ACC. It's been transferred to a London control sector, but for whatever reason, the controller can't raise the aircraft on the radio. Um, Chrissy, can you just talk us through the steps that are taken next as part of that process? So yeah, absolutely. That's probably our most usual scenario in the fact that the civil supervisor would potentially notify uh, of a prolonged loss of comms. And like you say, it's usually on a transfer of sector and they haven't got the next frequency for whatever reason. Um, the civil supervisor would go and speak to our distress and diversion cell, who uh, usually are the ones to go out on guard frequency, the emergency frequency that everybody in the UK should be monitoring when they're airborne. Um, they would do three cycles on that uh, guard frequency to see if they can pick up the, the aircraft and if for whatever reason the three cycles go through and they can't get hold of them then we start triggering a, a sequence of events. We would then tell our Swanwick military soup who would then immediately coordinate with the control and reporting centre. The control and reporting centre would have already ID'd the aircraft anyway because they have people on doing that anyway in terms of approaching in, in UK airspace um, but then that would potentially set the trigger to uh, launch QRA and then in terms of launching QRA the usual ask is that they say to Swanwick controllers can you take the QRA aircraft on the path to whatever aircraft en route to the target as such um, we would then notify civil immediately and start coordinating that path, as Gary said, for QRA. Um, we'd probably take on uh, tankers potentially as well. Should we need to refuel the, the QRA en route or after their task? And then ultimately, we then pass just in the final few minutes over to our um, control and reporting centre counterparts to do the kind of final intercept, albeit we are trained to do that as well. Um, but it is, as you can imagine, it's a very quick, you know, flash to bang in terms of how many minutes you have to react to these things. So oh. because it's so pressured, we just make sure we practice it daily and, and that makes sure that it's seamless throughout. And, and it's not always necessarily a, a jet on the ground. It, it could be a, a jet that for a special event. I know in the G7, there was a, a different approach. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the beauty of QRA. You know, you can scale it um, and adapt it to, to your situation. So obviously with events like G7, you know, we've got a large number of VIPs, uh, you know, fairly isolated area of the country. You know, one of the things we can do with QRA is put a combat air patrol above the event. So essentially QRA can then uh, respond in seconds rather than minutes. Wow, it really is fascinating stuff. Um, something slightly, uh, slightly more miserable has been COVID-19. And from your side down at uh, RAF Swan at Chrissy, how's it been for you and what's the last 18 months look like? So I came onto the unit about 10 months ago and I think the main challenge was certainly from a welfare perspective, um, you know, in the forces we're used to enjoying kind of um, adventurous training, force development, sport, social, the things that kind of, you know, keep us part of the offer, if you like. Um, uh, and part of the problem is we've not been able to do those things. But on the flip side, we we have enjoyed some normality. Um, so the last year has seen an 8% rise in military movements. And therefore, we've remained you know, really busy throughout and remained in work. Um, so what really going forward we're keen to focus on is, is a safe regeneration of traffic with our Nats colleagues. Because while traffic levels have increased, the background picture for us has actually been less complex complex throughout this last year so we've had a lot of freedom to manoeuvre so going forward we need to be really mindful of each other's operation um, and we certainly expect that that rise in traffic to pick up gradually but it certainly will pick up in the coming months so we're planning kind of familiarisation training with each other so we feel comfortable coordinating traffic with each other and we can just make the operation as safe as possible. Mm. Gary what's your experience been like on the civil side? 
So um, strange. I, I left Swanwick um, at the beginning of 2019 uh, and came to work again with you, uh, Idiot Heathrow. Uh, and I, I guess I left a very different unit to the one that I came back to in uh, December of 2020. And walk, walking back into Swanwick, having been away for, for only 18 months, it, it genuinely did feel like a different place. Um, and I think the first thing that struck me coming back into in, into the operation was actually the balance between the numbers, um, the, the probably equal numbers of military and civilian personnel within the centre, which it, it isn't something that I I would previously have recognised. You know, it was a, a much bigger civil unit when I when I left. Um, coming back into the unit, it was actually quite comforting to see the, our, our military colleagues there. Um, we've been particularly careful to reduce the number of people that we've had within the centre. Um, I'm talking to you today from my daughter's bedroom, so the, the indication of the different way of working. Um, a, a lot of the support teams that um, that the controllers would normally um, would, would normally have to to assist them, um, the investigations, the training, the the procedures teams, they're all working from home as well. Um, it, it's it, it really has been a very different environment for us, and um, I, I guess for everyone in our home lives and in our working lives, we've had to get used to a different way of working. Um, I think the flexibility and the adaptability of all of our teams has been remarkable. Um, quite often we were we were hearing announcements on the news on a Monday evening at the same time as the rest of the country were uh, and and then trying to implement plans within within an ops room uh, and and w w from a building perspective within quite a vast area all at the same time um I think the the working relationship that that we have between Chrissy's team and my and 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 my team really has helped us to be able to do those things. I think that shared understanding and and that awareness that everyone's going through the same thing right now. What can we do to help each other? I think that's been a a, a really strong uh, element of of the success that we've had over the last um, uh, six to twelve months. Yeah, and when we have these kind of um, real difficult times and and periods. It's always um, quite reassuring when you see the, the military adapting and being as flexible as they are. They just end up doing all kinds of things. And I know that Chrissy, um, your guys down at RES Swanwick have been doing a whole host of other deployments during COVID. Can you give us an idea of, of what you've been up to? Yeah, absolutely. So in the last 16 months, you know, we've continued to support multiple different tasks in taskings and hold people at high readiness and that's obviously tailing off somewhat now but um still still you know kind of random things that we're doing across the uk uh, certainly a lot of our uh, personnel have deployed to support pcr testing in the community as hotspots have arisen um throughout the year also one of our project team uh, members spent almost a year on the covid uh, vaccine task force he was basically assuring the logistical change to make sure there was no interruption in vaccine delivery to the uk so you know quite a high profile job and another member of the project team was deployed for three months as a first responder in support of frontline ambulance services um, and then like I said we continue to hold people on readiness and we've got some people at the moment um, training to deliver vaccines should they be called upon to do that so really varied. Wow and you've also been supporting some pretty major large-scale exercises I believe as well. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like the exercise programme gets busier and busier every year. Um, it's because we're getting new capabilities coming online all the time. And in terms of the size and complexity of the exercises, they're always increasing to meet the, the operational training requirements. And clearly, 78 squadrons are a key enabler of actually pretty much every aviation exercise and a lot of the maritime exercises in the UK that involve any type of airspace management and air traffic management. So, um, in terms of you know some of the exercises we've we've controlled recently, um, we had a role to play in the carrier strike group uh, exercise strike warrior uh, that was very much supporting pre-positioning of assets and then controlling them throughout the exercise if they wanted to operate at high level. Um, equally, we touched on already about exercise cobra warrior. That presented obviously a slightly different challenge in the fact that whilst we were providing support to all the transits to the exercise area, there was also that civil angle of us providing uh, services in and out of Newcastle as well as and when required. Um, and then obviously there's all the supporting elements as well that we we support in terms of air to air refueling, uh, control and things like that. So, yeah, very varied uh, over the year and, and will continue to be. Wow, and, and amongst all of that and exercises and, and the, the normal day-to-day -day stuff, you've also set up your own lateral floor device testing site, is that correct? 
Yeah, so the MOD um, directed stations and and smaller units like ourselves uh, earlier in the year to establish our own uh, lateral flow device testing facilities. Um, I think the recognition was there that we needed on-site testing um, to be more agile in our response to people needing to isolate. Um, our airspace management team, again, three flight, were really quick to step up, step up to the challenge uh, when they were off shift. Uh, and they did an amazing job in terms of undertaking additional training that they wouldn't usually have to do. They supported all the logistical management of supplies. And ultimately, they set up a new uh, testing facility in, in about a week, um, Test, you know, with the capability to test all military personnel twice a week. Um, and that's, as usual, are very, very supportive. So they gave us the necessary space, cleaning support um, to facilitate the task. And in turn, we thought it was sensible and right. And it was accepted that we we should offer um, lateral flow device testing to everybody uh, across the Swanwick Centre, including, you know, our Nats colleagues. Excellent. A big success. Yeah, superb. And um, something else that's clearly been key during COVID has been cargo flights, especially those carrying those essential uh, medical supplies. So what, what, what's your role been and what's RS Swanwick's role been in that? So a again, very much just facilitating, you know, kind of the uh, air traffic movements, as it were, because I think it was realised really on with the scale of the pandemic that support was required across all sectors. So in terms of cargo flights, they're a really good example. The RAF was certainly transporting PPE into the UK uh, and transporting vaccines across, across the entire world. Yeah, and Gary, we've obviously seen a major increase in cargo operations. What's it been like on, on your side, on the civil side? So very similar to the way that um, that Chrissy talks, so, um, new operators, different operators going to different places. I certainly remember looking out of the windows at, at um, Heathrow and seeing quite a, a wide range of, of different aircraft that you wouldn't normally see. Um, that, that in itself presents a different challenge. Um, operators can be unfamiliar with some of our processes. Uh, our airspace is complex. Uh, e even when it's not particularly busy, our airspace is still complex. So providing support to people in and out of, of new areas of operation. Uh, and also making sure that, that vaccines being moved around the world weren't being delayed. So um, the airspace capacity management team that we have, um, fortunately based within uh, Swanwick, but operate on behalf of the UK, um, th they've certainly been helping from um, um, conversations that have been taking place worldwide to make sure that, that vaccines aren't delayed and to make sure that the flights carrying them are given the appropriate priority to get to, to get to where they need to go. Uh, I think that, that that's something that the team were particularly proud that they were able to support, particularly in the early days uh, when when supplies and vaccines were, were being sent quite far and wide. It was really nice to see the involvement that they were able to have. Yeah, and, and I guess, Chrissy, the the constant change and the, the the way that the the Royal Air Force is is been so dynamic over the last decade is it's only going to continue in that direction, and there's always going to be some change coming up. And what does the RAF of say twenty years time look like? Um, big question. I think one of the biggest changes we'll see in air traffic and airspace management is probably more integration with uh, remotely piloted air systems. Um, certainly I was looking into it the other day, Team Tempest, which is a consortium of industry partners working with the RAF, are looking at delivering the replacement to Typhoon in the next 15 years. And they're looking at all modes of operating, you know, whether it's um, manned, unmanned, a combination thereof. So I think that's going to probably present a challenge for us and a, quite a, a stark change to what we're used to for the next 20 years. Uh, certainly, obviously, there's things very internal to the unit here. You know, we'll be going on to a, a new common platform with DP en route. Um, so potentially uh, the control of aircraft may become easier over time. And I think you've probably seen but uh, space is quite a growth area. And so whilst it's moved out of just RAF and we've now established Space Command on the 1st of April, uh, there's still an RAF uh, officer in charge of that. And I've got no doubt that that's going to grow in terms of capabilities and size. And we'll continue to work with international partners in terms of the Combined Space Operations Centre in the US. Um, and, and I think probably another broad brush area that we're we're definitely expanding into is, is sustainability um, and making our force fit for the future. And I guess that's where our ASTRA concept fits in quite nicely to our okay. future. Can you can you tell us a bit more about Astra? What, what exactly is that? 
Um, I think the best way to describe it is a concept uh, to build the next generation Air Force. Um, and in terms of the, the pillars, as it were, of what's underneath that Astra concept, it captures people, training, infrastructure and equipment. Um, and certainly, you know, kind of looking at new ways of working for the future. I think we've probably seen from the last year and a bit that COVID supercharged almost that that of term of evolving into a new way of working, uh, certainly more flexible working arrangements, much more virtual engagement. Um, and I think that virtual engagement has probably expanded into all areas of our service life. Um, like I was saying earlier, we've really missed out on sports and FD and things like that. But where we have developed is in places like esports. Um, one of the RF Gaming Association, for example, is is has grown exponentially over over this last year, and that just provides a different form of socialising uh, virtually. So yeah, there's there's definitely much change to come. Yeah, Gary, I'm, I'm guessing from your background as well that you're the same as me. And that I'm I'm a, in a shed at the bottom of the garden, <laughs> and you you don't look like you're in a Nat's office right now. No, definitely not. Uh, I really am in my daughter's bedroom. For for for, for those that maybe didn't believe it last time, um, I I think it's really interesting listening to Christy talk about what the RAF of the future looks like and and what some of the challenges that that her team will face. Uh, and I suspect it probably comes as no surprise based on the way this conversation has gone so far that you could take all of that and copy it directly across into Nats. So the, the, similarly with the work that we do between remote piloted and, and piloted aircraft, very much previously been from a segregated perspective and now looking to how do we operate them safely together in combined airspace uh, as opposed to having to separate out. The, the benefit of not needing to sterilize airspace for a single um, uh, um, aircraft to then operate, the benefit that we get from a sustainability perspective, um, trying to, to help not only from a CO2 point of view for, for the planet, but also from a, a fuel, both burn and cost point of view for the airlines, probably more important now with some of the challenges that we face uh, commercially as an industry than, than we would ever have seen before. Um, I think our ways of working, ironically, have probably brought us closer together. Uh, I certainly find it much easier to talk to colleagues in the military, at airports, and actually right across the country. Uh, the, the the team that I work in, we, we've got um, um, one person based in Northern Ireland, a couple of people based up in Scotland, and a couple of people based down south, yet we operate as though we're sat in one room continuously together. Uh, and I I'm not sure any of us really thought that we'd be operating like this when when we first saw what teams looked like 18 months ago. Um, I think listening to Chrissy talk about um, her team of the future, uh, again, th th that benefit that we get from diversity, that benefit that we get from different people working within our organisations, and actually for people working across our organisations as well. Um, I've got people within my team who support cadets, I've got people within my team who are reservists, and the, the, the ability that those, those skills that they develop within the military fit so well into the task that we're trying to do, not only from an air traffic perspective, but just from a, from a leadership point of view, uh, from their team working, their communication, all of the core values that, that, that we would look for within our teams really do share quite nicely between the two organisations. Brilliant. What what's Nats doing about that then, Gary? If we're if we're getting all those benefits from those guys being reservists or volunteers in the armed forces, what what are we doing to to get to get the best out of them? So I I was fortunate enough to be at Swanwick in 2017 when we first signed up to the military covenant, uh, and I think that 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 was our physical presence commitment to being able to support those people um, uh, within uh, within our teams. Uh, we've just increased the number of days that people can now uh, take uh, paid leave for in order to support their opportunities as reservists uh, and, and also to support the cadets. So we've just increased that from uh, from six days to 10, uh, which, um, which we hope gives them the opportunity to develop more of those skills uh, within their military roles. Um, you touched on right at the very beginning of um, of, of this piece, AD, about uh, Armed Forces uh, Week being this week. Um, I really quite enjoyed within our internal newsreel reading all of the, the various personal stories of people's experiences, those who've been um, uh, regular within the forces and then come out and now continue to support as reservists, and also those who who um, have uh, previously worked uh, within um, the, the military and now apply their skills within a civil environment. I think 
that ability to share those messages, to share the experience, and actually to encourage people to talk about it. Uh, maybe not something that we're that we're very good at doing of of singing our own praises, but that ability to share that around the company and to share those stories and to encourage people to do that. I think that really helps with people's understanding. Um, partly of some of the challenges that people face, but also of uh, the support that they and their family might be providing, not just the 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 people who are in the services themselves, but the, the, the families and the loved ones who are who are potentially going without that person for a period of time. I think it really helps people to understand that too. Yeah, and I, I, I did say at the start of this, it was going to be really tough to fit everything in, and I knew it would. So <laughs> I'm just going to, Gary, ask you one thing. Um, Chrissy mentioned DP on route, and we talk about it all the time within Nats. But for those of our viewers who, who aren't quite sure, I'm, I'm going to ask Gary Dixon to be very quick here. It's going to be very difficult <laughs> to give a short answer. But what is DP on route and what does it mean for civil and military controllers? So DP on route is about the deployment of a single platform uh, for our, our upper area controllers at Prestwick, at Swanwick, uh, and for the military control team. Um, it'll put civil and military side by side in a purpose-built operations room, uh, and it'll provide um, great flexibility, single tool set, uh, and, and genuine state-of-the-art equipment for the controllers to be able to do their task. Um, the equipment's currently being developed. It's a joint project team uh, from, from Swanwick, from Prestwick, uh, and from the military, uh, and they'll be developing the tools to implement uh, trajectory-based um, uh, technology uh, shared across all, all, all three elements. Um, it, it, it very much will be a first for us trying to join, not just from a technology perspective, but from a procedures and from a way of working perspective as well, and really will help us to align the way that we do things much more closely, both across our own company and also with, uh, with our military colleagues that side by side. Fantastic. Brilliant stuff. I think it's probably time for us to go to some questions. Uh, our first one is from Craig. Uh, Chrissy, let's ask you, do RAF and civil controllers at Swanwick use exactly the same technology or are there slight differences? So uh, certainly in the area task, as I understand it, Gary, you might be able to correct me. Um, I, I believe we use exactly the same technology, but we use it in a subtly different way in terms of how we control aircraft. Um, so we, you know, we're essentially providing services outside of controlled airspace primarily, whereas the civil controllers are providing services within controlled airspace. So whilst we're all on the same platform, as it were, we we subtly provide different services. Okay, um, Gary, we've got a question from Bradley. That's quite a good one. Uh, are military controllers able to jump straight into civilian controller role or is there some kind of a conversion or do they have to go through the whole civil format? Uh, so they, they need to go back through the civil licensing course. Um, interesting, the, the college course that I did when I went through the college, uh, I had two, mili two ex-military controllers who were converting it into, into civil. Um, as much as we use the same equipment and there's a lot of skills that are that are applicable from one to the other, it is a slightly different task that we do. Uh, so it, 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 it's, it's very much build on, build on what you've learned already and then apply it into a civil world um, with great success from what I've seen as well. Great stuff. Um, Alistair asks Chrissy, um, with the success of the digital control tower at London City Airport, is the RAF looking at anything similar at any of its airfields? So I, I've been in the London City Digital Tower and I have to say it's it's amazing. Um, it is an amazing capability and 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 the RAF in general will always be on top of new capabilities emerging. So I know our capability office is looking into digital towers, not specifically for any airfield at the moment, as I understand, um, but it's certainly a technology that we've got our eye on. Great stuff. Um, another one for you, got to be from you, it's Glenn from the Belgian Air Force, who says, are there any further plans to um, develop some synergies between civil and military ATC, such as through controller training or the sharing of new technology. Sorry, is that for me, AD? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, okay. I'm not, I'm not going to direct a question from the Belgian Air Force today. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of synergies, um, I think probably a good example is at the moment in terms of our QRA training, as it were, uh, we're sharing that with our uh, Nats colleagues. So we're trying to um, just upskill everybody in the building on, on air defence in general. So that's um, trying to find some synergies there. And the other thing was controller training. Uh, and actually probably a good example of that is maybe the regeneration uh, of traffic, that familiarisation training. So, uh, you know, we've had a long period of, of not having that many civil controllers in the building. 
and they're expecting obviously quite a surge in traffic. So we're trying to get um, our military controllers sat with civil, civil controllers sat with military, so we can understand each other's operation a little bit better in preparation for when it gets busier. Does that answer that? Yeah, fantastic. Um, Gary, you can start with this one, but I'm, I'm really interested in Chris's view as well. Um, who has the authority to order an airspace shutdown, um, such as in the event of a 9-11 uh, type of incident. I remember being there firsthand on the day uh, and and very quickly trying to scramble together some kind of airspace closure uh, around some key areas. So, so Gary, on, on your side of it, how, how does that work? So generally the information would come to us from the military controllers. Uh, it, it's not something that my team have the ability to do. Um, th there's there's a, a range of different things that we might be asked to do, and there's a range of scenarios that the team will plan for, but but generally it, it will come from the military team, from um, potentially from the military or potentially from the government as well, uh, and then it will be a plan that, that we would have to enact. Um, it may be related to a specific area, uh, or it could be related to the whole volume of the UK. We will react to whatever it is that, that, that we're asked to do so uh, on those grounds. Wow, well, Chrissy, what, what, what's, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I, I accord with what Gary said in terms of it's a ministerial direction informed by the military chain of command. And then we work, work very closely in the building here. Um, clearly, you know, clearing the airspace um, is very much probably a, a civil perspective because the military would continue to provide and support uh, for air defence. Um, and in terms of, you know, it, it's not just for a 9-11 type shutdown either. We've seen in, you know, throughout history, what was it, about 10 years ago, we had to close down UK airspace for volcanic ash. Of course, yeah. Um, and then obviously there's also, you know, potential technical failures as well, you know, in the future. So, you know, safety is always got to be at the forefront of everything we do. Great. Um, thank you. So next question is from Alan, uh, who's uh, in the Royal Navy, who asks us, how do you expect um, air traffic to pick up in the coming months and how will that have an impact on your current working partnership? Gary, give us some idea of what you see the, your crystal ball looks like. I wish my crystal ball was a little bit clearer because I think my buzzword in this answer is going to be uncertainty. Um, uh, Current forecast, how do I see air traffic picking up? Uh, I'd like to think it was gradual and I'd like to think it was continuous. Um, uh, recent history would tell me that I don't always get what I want in the, in those areas. Uh, we, we've seen quite a bit of, of, of variation in air traffic. Um, right across the operation, if I take the UK as a whole, we're operating currently about 30% of what we were doing for a similar time in 2019. But that probably doesn't really tell the full story. There's certain times of day when we're much busier than others. And the certain areas of the airspace that are, that, that, that are, are busier than others too, just because of where people want to operate. Um, I'm really fortunate that we've got a brilliant analytics team and a, a, a brilliant um, uh, airspace team who continuously uh, look at uh, all of the forecasting data that, that we see coming and not only out of Europe, but also from intelligence that we get direct from airports and from airlines. Uh, and we continually update and build a short term forecast model on the back of that. Um, members of um, Chrissy's team, members of my team, we, we all share that information between us. We're, we're looking at all of the same data. And, and then as Chrissy said earlier, we're preparing the teams as best as we can for, for what might come up. Um, I, I think we'd all like it to be a little bit busier, probably a little bit quicker than, than, than it currently is right now. Um, and uh, it's certainly been nice uh, where, where we have seen growths of traffic, particularly over the last few weeks. Um, uh, I think uh, everyone will recognise from from the, the news, the increase in traffic to Portugal uh, and, and various increases that we're seeing around Europe as well. I think we really would quite like to see the, the, the summer open up a little bit more there. Great stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Echo those comments, certainly. Um, Chrissy, a question for you from Alfie, who asks, how long did it take you to qualify as an air traffic controller in the RAF? So post my initial officer training, um, it took me six months uh, on the joint air traffic control course, which is a terminal uh, air traffic course to qualify as a terminal controller. And then I was lucky to be selected to go straight to area radar at a centre like this back in West Drayton way, way when. And um, to do that, I had to do a conversion course from terminal air traffic to area radar. Uh, and that took a further month to get that qualification. But clearly, when you turn up on a unit for the first time, you might have done that kind of phase two training, if you like, but you're still not fully ready to go. There's still a long period of on-job training then. 
So when I arrived at West Drayton as a brand new flying officer, there was then a period of about two or three months, I think it was, with people sat behind me, you know, whether it was Sims and then went to the live environment before they were happy to let me loose. <laughs> I, I've got to jump in at that point, Adi. Um, Chrissy was clearly a much better air traffic controller than I ever was because she managed to complete that much more quickly than I did from a civil <laughs> perspective. <laughs> I think I, I think I managed 12 months in college, followed by nine or 10 months uh, at, at uh, Heathrow. I think a fair few times with you sat on my shoulders as well. Um, so, yeah, Chrissy, well, I take my hat off to you. Clearly got through that much, much more easily than I did. How do you think I managed to gather so much grey hair, Gary? <laughs> Stress. Yeah, you and I both. <laughs> Chrissy, uh, Teresa asks, how is COVID, i.e. less traffic in the air, allow the MOD to perform operations, which would usually be really difficult because you've got loads of aeroplanes in the way. So has it has it made that easier to get things from A to B and do things that you wouldn't normally do? There's no doubt about it. We've had so much more freedom to manoeuvre and having a less complex background picture means less interactions with civil uh, and therefore you, you can get so much more done. Like I said, the the number of uh, military movements has, has increased and we've still managed to to support that but i think probably the um a big indicator is those big exercises i talked about like formidable shield cobra warrior you know blocking off large swathes of airspace and it's had minimal disruption to civil um clearly going forward as civil traffic increases that will have more of an impact and we'll have to test and adjust those types of exercises and be more agile in our airspace management um, and management of the general exercise just to ensure everyone gets that balance of airspace. Superb. Um, next question has come from uh, Manuel who has asked about, we've been talking about the guys sitting side by side doing the, the tactical coordination on the day. Uh, but what about the pre-tax stuff and the strategic level planning? So I've, I've seen this myself in the last couple of weeks with, with a certain uh, American visitor to the UK and the, the level of interaction that's required for uh, a G7 summit or a, or a Portus visit, a presidential visit to an airport involves a huge amount of coordination before the day itself between military and civil. Um, for your large scale exercises, who's doing all of that planning, Chrissy, and how does it work in coordination with the Nats teams? So there's there's a range of people that um, and departments that that contribute to these exercises. So we have a uh, 92 squadron who are uh, based at Waddington, who are very much kind of, you know, create some of these high level exercises um we have jteps which is a joint organization that contributes towards you know the planning of exercises but all of these exercises we have kind of initial planning conferences and we have main planning conferences and that's where kind of all players come together and join together including nats um where we kind of discuss the requirements of the exercise and depending on the scale and complexity like with formidable shield you know the planning can start years in advance um you know smaller scale things can just literally be a matter of weeks before execution yeah yeah absolutely um another quick question from uh, from glenn from belgian air force who's asked about the f-35 so is there anything in particular christy that you've had to do to prepare for the f-35 specifically in terms of the airspace um our team particular 78 squadron not really um ultimately it's another platform that we control and provide services to uh, but in terms of the airspace um the 323 danger area complex which covers kind of the north sea area um that was adapted slightly in terms of the the size and scale and how you can book out that airspace to meet the demands of of what that that aircraft platform needed Okay, excellent. Uh, we've got one last question, uh, and it's for me, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> unrelated, unrelated to the really interesting presentation, are those real or pretend <laughs> windows behind you in the shed, and where can I get them from? Uh, well, th th there you go. There's there's my uh, my first class lounge, uh, complete <laughs> with seven three seven seats. Those of you who are aviation enthusiasts on the webinar will be interested in what these are from Golf Bravo Uniform Hotel Kilo, which is a former British Airways 737, available from all good aviation enthusiast outlets. I, um, I fear, Chrissy, we've just been outdone by AD's sales pitch. Yeah. <laughs> and, and on that very, very sad, sad note, 
um, it's time to say goodbye, and that's all we've got time for. Um, I've absolutely loved it, really enjoyed it. I'd like to thank uh, Chrissy and Gary. Uh, what's been a really fascinating discussion. Uh, loads of stuff that I honestly didn't really know about. Uh, we will be back in a few weeks' time with another very interesting topic, so please stay tuned. In the meantime, if you've got any feedback for us or some ideas, please get in touch uh, via info at nats.co.uk or via our numerous social media channels. So thanks again. Have a great rest of the week and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.